Hello and welcome to the one-on-one -on -one author interviews. And today we've got Jonathan Mayberry as our guest. I am so thrilled to welcome Jonathan. And so I'm going to turn the mic over to him and let him introduce himself. Hi, I'm Stephen King. I write the bestsellers. That, oh wait, no, that's <laughs> um, I'm Jonathan Mayberry. I'm a New York Times bestselling multi-genre author. I write science fiction, fantasy, horror, thrillers, mysteries, comics, probably some other genres I'm forgetting at the moment. Um, I write for adults, middle grade and teens. And um, I, uh, I write comics for Marvel, IDW and Dark Horse. And I had a TV show on Netflix recently called V Wars. Uh, prior to that, I was a nonfiction writer for a long time, kind of part time and a, a martial arts teacher full time. And uh, I also am editor of Weird Tales magazine and the president of the International Association of Media Tie-In Writers, which are people who write books and stories attached to movies, TVs, video games, and so on. So that's that, that's the short version of, of me. I, basically, I can't focus is what it boils down to. <laughs> now, you say that, and yet so much of your work, if not all your work, really kind of circles around a loose definition of horror in all its many forms. What drew you to that genre? Well, I was I was draw, I was kind of bred to the horror genre. My grandmother, if you can imagine Luna Lovegood from the Harry Potter books as an old lady, <laughs> the, the person who believed in believes in everything. That was my grandmother. She believed in what she called the larger world. And it wasn't just the supernatural, you know, she also believed in uh, you know, aliens and other things. So she brought science elements into it, but taught me not only the folklore of it and you know, the folk stories and the classical stories of it but taught me to read the, the science and anthropology and archeology span associated with it, to try to understand the cultural uh, and belief perspectives of, of people. So that was, my, that was my childhood, you know, like she was my favorite living relative or favorite relative at the time. Um, and uh, from there, I started reading, you know, all the, the classic horror stuff, monster, reading about the, the vampires and, and werewolves and other things that she had told me about. And I just kept, expanding out from there. Um, but as, as valid as it is to say that there's a horror element in most of my fiction, um, the one thing that also overlays that is a thriller model. Almost everything I write, no matter what genre I write in, is a thriller model. It's the race against time to prevent something bad, whether it's a supernatural monster, an alien invasion, whatever. And um, that that actually is the, the a direct result of having met one of the masters of horror when I was a kid, Richard Matheson, who wrote the Shrinking Man and I Am Legend, Hell House, um, because his 1954 book, I Am Legend, is the template for all of the, the weird science apocalyptic stuff that guys like me and James Rollins and, and Michael Crichton and other and so on write. If it wasn't for that book, we wouldn't be doing this. Okay. So coming up through that time period, reading all of that over a period of years, horror has its... Um, it's conventions, it's conventional stories that come and go. It's, it's uh, subgenres that wax and wane. Um, and they often say that when people are going through trying times, horror sees a resurgence. Have you seen that to be true? And why do you think that might be? Oh, it, it's definitely true. And you can look back through the decades and see that um, what it boils down to is if we're faced, if we're dealing with a crisis in our own world and we have the pandemic and other things going on, the political unrest and so on that's going on in our world, those things are horrible to us. I mean, they're, they're the monsters that we deal with right now, but they don't have a good third act. And in horror, we can, we can create a monster that is a stand-in for whatever we're actually afraid of. And at the end, the good guys find a way to defeat the monster. So there, there is that cathartic process in horror where you, know, you give what appears to be an insurmountable problem, you know, some monster, a, an invasion, or whatever it's going to be, that just appears to be beyond the scope of the characters. But in the process of the story, we see ordinary people leveling up to, to learn how to deal with it and eventually actually dealing with it. And that's a comfort to us because, you know, if, if they can do it, we kind, of, we kind of feel that we can do it as well. And I think, I think it, that engenders within us a, a hope that's at the end of this, the good guys will win. And, and so I think that has a lot to do with our love of horror. Now that's an interesting take on it because I have heard other people say that something that distinguishes say horror from 
dark fantasy is that horror builds on a sense of hopelessness. And yet you're talking about ordinary guys and, and you know, ordinary people leveling up to defeat the big bad. Um, is and, that- and yet it's the same, it is actually the same thing because just because it builds on a sense of hopelessness does not mean it ends with hopelessness. Hopelessness is, the, is what we feel. It's, it's actually the, the doorway for us in there because we feel hopeless about the things that have been going on. Like a year ago when the pandemic was, was exploding and you know, um, we saw no end in sight. There were no vaccines. There were no, no reliable treatments and we felt hopeless about it. But you know, now, now there are things happening and, the, and fewer deaths and fewer infections. So we see then, then the third act of that story finally happening. But when it first started, we, definitely the hopelessness was there. You know, with Jurassic Park, we know dinosaurs are going to get out and eat people. That's that's kind of hopeless if you happen to be on on the island. But you also have in the back of your mind the knowledge that it's at the end of the story, somebody is going to survive, and hopefully the good guys. Mm -hmm. And so horror may may dangle hopelessness, but it is not the purpose of horror to be hopeless at the end. Okay. There are some genres that are, you know, mm -hmm. so the torture genres and so on are that. But m most horror, most even most mainstream horror. Um, that's the dark car that we walk down toward whatever, wherever that, that welcoming um, light of safety might be. And, you know, right on cue, we've got rumbling thunder. I don't know if it carries to the, the microphone, but it is a dark and stormy night as we speak. So <laughs> perfect stage setting. Of course, you know, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in Phoenix where it's 105 and feels like the end of the world. So, you know, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, do we die by water? Do we die by fire? I mean, exactly. You know. <laughs> Speaking of which, there are different types of stories that that kind of cycle. It, there are the, um, you know, the Godzilla kind of uh, mutant atomic or man has outsmarted himself with technology and comes back to bite us on the butt stories. There's the climate change stories. There's the alien invasion stories. Uh, all of those different flavors, and they they come and go. Um, what are some of your favorites on that, or do you well, see some particularly coming back now? I, I've always been a big fan of outbreak stories of any kind, uh, and it's partly because you know when I was when I was thirteen, Richard Matheson gave me a copy of I Am Legend for Christmas, so I've I've had a lot of um, a, a long stretch of my life where that that book was so influential so i love outbreak stories in all their different types whether it's in you know i am legend the original book was a vampire outbreak um george romero took the model and re recast it as a zombie outbreak and so on I, I love outbreak stories because often they deal with people who do in fact have to level up and often they're 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 scientists or people with with some degree of of skill and the optimism that you know, if you apply the right science, you get the right answers. I am a science junkie, going way back. Um, I, in fact, my favorite genre of all of these things is what's known as science fiction horror. Everything from Alien to Event Horizon to, uh, you know, basically those types of stories, zombie stories, or, or science fiction horror. Um, so, be, I, I like the rational approach to trying to solve a problem, and those types of stories are, are very compelling for me. That's why I like certain types of zombie stories, um, which is one of the favorite of genres of mine to write in, because the zombie, you know, it, it's a wholly fictional construct in the way that it's presented in the films. The zombies in the George Romero films have nothing to do with Haitian uh, beliefs or, or the, the religion of voodoo, nothing to do with that at all. They're flesh-eating ghouls, reanimated tissue, um, and mostly not based on any folkloric model. So they're a monster that once presented becomes an easy stand-in for anything else that we're afraid of. But specifically those things that we're afraid of on a big scale, something so catastrophic, it strips away the affectation that we normally play. You know, we all take different roles every day. We're a different person with our spouses than we are with our friends, than we are with our boss and so on. Um, takes all that away because the infrastructure collapses and those affectations are tied to the, the infrastructure. It allows then the story to no longer focus on the zombie, but the effect of having our lives laid, laid bare, which means that every good zombie story is not about zombies, but about people in crisis. An endlessly renewable and fascinating topic. And as somebody who loves problem solving fiction, I mean, it's, it's perfect for me. 
you know, and I think a lot of people are drawn to it for the same reason. You know, there, you learn the zombie rules. And if you learn the zombie rules, you can survive. And if you don't learn the zombie rules, you die. And there's kind of a lesson in that for all of us, you know, don't play with, don't play with that piece of, of radioactive material, you're going to get cancer, you know, things, things that we can learn and then apply, which in its way then empowers us as, as the characters in the book and the readers who are, who take those characters as proxies, it empowers us to feel that, that if we just learn the right stuff, we are going to survive that. So having now lived through a pandemic, does watching a, <laughs> how people have reacted change your thoughts for the next outbreak book you write? Oh God, uh, the next outbreak book I write is going to have a lot more stupid people in it. Um, a lot. I, I, I actually did a couple, this is weird, right before the pandemic, I, I started a comic book at IDW called Pandemica, um, which dealt with a bioengineered disease that, that in, in the book was deliberately released by a, a, a white supremacist group that was trying to uh, reduce the numbers of people who were not white. Um, and um, I did a lot of work on the genetics and so on to, to make that as scary and plausible as possible. And it started coming out just before uh, the current pandemic. It was actually for a while put on pause because it was hitting a little too close to home, even though the entire thing had been written in 2019. Um, so it, I, I feel like I've already done some of what I would do next based on uh, on this this pandemic because it was in that book. It was in that comic book series. Um, but if I if I do another another plague book, I will definitely dive even more deeply into the the um, uh, party over over country, party over common sense, uh, the bias against actual facts. That's going to play a lot more of a role in myself because I absolutely dislike, and I would go as far as say loathe, anyone who puts their own personal agenda above the needs of the many. Um, that I find is an appalling thing. And it's also the least patriotic thing or compassionate or empathetic thing I've ever heard. But we saw it for, for the entire length of that, of that disease. Um, so yeah, that'll, that'll, that'll influence future writings on that type of, of topic. Yeah, I, I always was critical of horror movies where everybody heard a noise in the basement and went in the basement to look at it thinking, who would do that? And I've completely revised my, my expectations now. I, I used to have this weirdly optimistic uh, view that people were, more people were smarter than, than it appeared and that there were, uh, it was a greater majority of good hearted people out there. That, that belief has taken some real hits over the last uh, couple of years. Real hits. Unfortunately true. Now you mentioned when you were giving us the broad brush overview of all the things you've done that you write for adults, middle grade and teens. What sparked the interest in uh, branching out into those other uh, audience groups and how, how do you split off what you like to write and make it appropriate to those readers? Well, um, the way I got started in it was completely unintentional. And I blame my agent for it. Um, I had been invited by Christopher Golden, who is an excellent writer and th anthologist, to contribute a novella to a, a, an anthology he was doing called The New Dead, which were all zombie stories from a, a perspective that was fresh to the, the writers. Each of us had to go outside of our comfort zone. At the time, I had never done a post-apocalyptic story. And I had never done a story with a teen protagonist. So I, I wrote a story called A Family Business about an older brother teaching a younger brother how to be a zombie hunter 14 years after the, the zombie apocalypse. My, it went into the anthology, got a lot of good reviews, that, that's that novella. And my agent, who usually doesn't read uh, short, my shorter works, because she usually handles my longer ones, read it because of the reviews in Publishers Weekly and, and New York Times and so on, and said, this reads like the opening of a YA, young adult. I'm like, no, it's not. Um, I, had, I had not intended it to be read, written for teens just because it was a teen protagonist. And I hadn't read a young adult novel since To Kill a Mockingbird in the seventh grade. So she sent me a whole box of books of what was contemporary, this is 2008 or nine, of, of, of the new young adult books. And I was blown away. Scott Westerfeld, Cassandra Clare, Holly Black. I mean, these people were amazing. And um, I realized that not only had young adult come of age, it had 
come of age in a fearless way where the writers were no longer bound by any kind of genre lines. They went wherever the story went. If, they, if it meant crossing genre lines five times, it's what they did, which is incredibly liberating for a writer. So she, you know, she asked if she could take that novella and shop it as the opening of a YA novel. And I reluctantly agreed saying, you know, you're gonna be disappointed. Uh, one auction later, Simon and Schuster bagged it uh, and a whole bunch of sequels. There are now seven books in the what's now the Rot and Ruin series. The movie is now in development for film. Uh, there was a comic book adaptation and there was also a, a web, web adaptation on Webtoons that was the number one horror comic on Webtoons. I didn't do the adaptation, by the way. Um, and Taylor Grant did. And, but something that I never really intended to do suddenly became, you know, it, it, it's required reading in 8,000 schools around the world. It's, you know, it, it, it's nuts. You know, it's like, I'm still surprised by, by what happened to that novella I wrote, you know, for an adult zombie anthology. Um, but the, in the actual writing for YA, the only thing I change is I'm far less potty mouth than I write for teens. I am notably potty mouth when I write for adults, as it has been pointed out to me, but I don't really care. Um, and uh, there are some things that I won't put explicitly on the page. Like, for example, um, if there was a reference to, to sexual abuse, that might be a reference to it. I'm not going to put it on the page. Uh, but violence and, and uh, heartbreak and, and extreme stuff, I, I did put on the page because I don't believe in writing down to teens. If anything, I like writing up to them. I've met teens these days, and they're way smarter than, than adults give them credit for. But now, with middle grade, which is, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, that came about a different way. Um, after I had made my footprint in, in YA, I found my dream diaries from when I was 11. Um, I used to dream in sequence. Each night, the story would pick up where it left off until the story wrapped. Uh, I have a weird brain, you know, and a lot, a lot of writers have weird brains. So I pitched that over lunch with my editor and he said, oh, we got to do those. And he bought two books in the series, Kim the Nightsiders. It's basically me collaborating with my 11 year old self. And those stories are different in that since they're mostly for fourth graders, there's no romance in there. Um, I don't have a shifting point of view. This, the narrative structure is a little less complicated. I don't say simpler, less complicated. Um, but I still don't pull any emotional punches or thematic punches because I respect what kids that age go through in the real world, having come up very hard myself um, in a very rough situation, rough family life. So I respect the, the intensity that they, you know, they experience, um, but I also respect their ability to self-censor. If it's not going to be for them, they won't read it. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's fascinating. And I love the, the insight into that. You also have done comics. And so are they comics that were standalone and not related to something that you had written as a novel or a mesh of the two? Or how did that happen? A bit of both. Uh, I got scouted by Marvel, by Axel Alonso, editor-in-chief of Marvel, who had read my novel Patient Zero and then just literally called me out of the blue and asked me if I'd like to write for Marvel. The silliest question I've ever been asked. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> It's like, would you like it? Would you like a puppy? Yes, I would. You know, um, so I so I went up writing. You know, I start off. My first thing was a Wolverine project, then a Punisher project, then a Captain America project. So I went up doing a lot of stuff for Marvel, and was the regular writer on Black Panther for two years, um, which was one of the greatest privileges of my life. Um, and I got to write the feminist Black Panther because when Reginald Hudlin, who was writing it before me, handed it off to me. He had T'Challa get injured, so his sister Shuri had to step up to be the Panther. And he did that because I had spent 30 some years of my life te teaching women self-defense. So he wanted to give me something to really have fun with. So I got to do the feminist Black Panther for two years. And, um, but then after that, I, I focused uh, almost exclusively on original project. Um, I did the, a project for Dark Horse that was a straight vampire, downbeat vampire comic. Uh, I moved to IDW, I created my V-Wars project for books and comics there. The only other project I've done that was um, in any way connected to another license, after George Romero died, um, the estate had a script that he had started called Road of the Dead, which would probably will probably never be produced. Um, but they wanted to do a comic book prequel to it in hopes that it would um, you know, it, it fill in the gap for audiences who are waiting for a little more Romero. And they know I had worked with Romero before he died. 
So I did Highway to Hell, Road of the Dead, Highway to Hell, and had a blast with that. And then Weird Tales, because you've got a little bit of everything going on here. Yeah, Weird Tales came out, came, also came at me out of the blue, but that comes with, with a lot of interesting, weird uh, connections. Well, first off, when I was a kid, um, the secretary or the, the uh, middle school librarian where I was going to school was the secretary for a couple of clubs of professional writers, one that met in Philly and one that met in New York. Philly crowd was the epic fantasy crowd, George Sithers, Sprague de Camp, that crowd. And the New York crowd was whichever science fiction fantasy writers were in town at the time would have these, you know, informal party slash meetings at this publisher's penthouse. And she would drag me along. So I got to meet Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson, Harlan Ellison, Arthur C. Clarke, you know, all these guys when I was a kid. Um, and that, that was, you know, greatly influential for me. Um, God, I wandered off on the side and I forgot what the question was. And weird uh, tales. Weird tales, okay, yeah. I know, I was getting there, I was getting there. So <laughs> um, Sprague de Camp, who was, who was one of the, the people from the fantasy group, but also Robert Block, who was one of the people, he wrote Psycho. You know, mm -hmm. uh, for the other group were huge Weird Tales fans, Block having published in Weird Tales exclusively. And de Camp was the one who got the, the unfinished Conan manuscripts um, from the estate of Robert E. Howard given to him through the literary agent, uh, Oscar J. Friend, uh, the junior partner of the Otis Klein Agency. And um, you know, so I, I was exposed to Weird Tales through two major influences on me. Um, and and Sprague de Camp also became a mentor of mine. Roll forward um, to when I'm married to Sarah, um, her grandfather was Oscar J. Friend, the, the literary agent who gave the unfinished manuscripts to de Camp. Okay. So one day we went through my scrapbook and she's like, why are you, why are you sitting in a photo with Uncle Sprague? I'm like, <laughs> now unofficial uncle, but still, you know. Um, and um, so I, you know, I have that connection there. Um, the first book I ever bought with my own money was a copy of Conan the Wanderer, an old Lancer paperback that, um, you know, where the Conan stories originally published in Weird Tales. And I've got all these different connections, all these different places. And then a producer buddy of mine said, hey, you know, there's a group that, that's bought the, the Weird Tales library and trademark. They want to know if you want to write a story for them. So I said, absolutely. I wrote a fan, you know, a swords and sorcery story. When they got the story, they also said, you know what, uh, we'd like you to maybe curate the first issue of, of, the, of the return. Would you want to be the editorial director? And I said, hell yes. So I did that. And then, then they made me full editor which I am now, and my second issue came out more recently. And um, so now I'm the editor of Weird Tales. And that, that was a, one of those bucket list things that was so much of a stretch. It was like, I'd love to do that. There's no chance. And also the magazine was currently idle. It died mm -hmm. many times over the years. And I was a big fan during the Ann Vandermeer run when she was the editor of Weird Tales, which I personally think was the greatest run of Weird Tales in the modern era. Um, so I was, I was delighted to step on board. and. We've got some really exciting stuff coming up with Weird Tales. Um, I just finished the new issue, which has stories by Amakatsu and Fran Wild and uh, just a bunch of other writers. And the winter issue is a swords and sorcery issue. So it's kind of like old, uh, it brings me back to my roots. And Michael Moorcock, one of the greatest fantasy writers of all time, just gave me an excerpt of the new Elric novel for that issue. Wow. For the sixth anniversary of Elric. And, um, that was, I mean, Michael Moorcock is, I had, before I found out that, I had actually just finished writing an epic fantasy novel and dedicated it to him. And then suddenly here he is, you know, the world is very weird, but it's weird in a good way. So big fan of that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a terrific story uh, and a little bit of a weird tale. So there you go. <laughs> Um, now, you've touched on writing some of the tie-in work, and, and obviously, um, uh, you're now president of the International Tie-In uh, Writers Association. That means you've, you've done quite a bit of work in that area. How do, you, um, how do you put on one hat and take off the other hat when it comes to writing the tie-in works versus uh, writing all the original work that you do? You know, I'm, I'm one of those writers that I, I benefit from having studied journalism rather than creative writing, I think. Because in journalism, we're we're not precious about our work. We're not we're not prima donnas about our work, and we don't wait for the muse to whisper in our ear. We write the damn thing, fix it, and rewrite, and move on. So even though we put our love and passion into what we write, 
it's a very practical viewpoint. And I'm a, I've, I consider myself a pragmatist. So some years ago, back in 2009, um, I had my, I think I had written four novels by then. I got a, a reach out from Universal Pictures because they had seen a Facebook post, by the way, I was discussing werewolf films on Facebook. Um, and they were redoing The Wolfman and they reached out and said, hey, would you uh, have any interest in writing the novelization of the new Wolfman film? Uh, we worked out a deal, I, I took the gig. It became my first New York Times bestseller um, and launched me into media tie-in work, which I'd never done before. Um, and by the way, I thought that when you did something like a movie novelization, you actually got to see the movie. Oh no, you get a, you get a script and a couple production drawings and that's it. Um, so, um, but when I, when, I take a, when I get a project like this, like Charlene Harris uh, reached out to me once and said, hey, would you uh, be interested in writing a Sookie st st uh, Stackhouse, you know, True Blood short story for me? And up to that point, I had read the books but not seen the show. So I had to do my homework, you know, um, and it was fun. And by the time I did my homework, I was in the groove. Max Brooks, who wrote World War Z, had reached out to me around the same time and asked me if I'd like to write a G.I. Joe novella for him, for an anthology he was doing. And when I was a kid, G.I. Joe was a 12 inch action figure from World War II, but these were the new science fiction ones, the little, you know. I, so they sent me a case of DVDs, toys and comics. So I sat on my living room floor watching G.I. Joe cartoons, playing with the toys, reading the comics for research. I was at work. Um, and since then, you know, every time something like this comes along, I just dive into the, the literature. Uh, I've done John Carter of Mars, Hellboy, uh, Wizard of Oz, which was resulted in one of my most important career moments ever. Um, that's the story for there. And also made me ugly cry. I'll, just, I'll tell you that story if you ask. Um, but also a bunch of other um, things. And Max Allen Collins, the, uh, the guy who wrote Road to Perdition and so on, at one of the conventions asked me if I'd like to, you know, take over the organization because he and he was stepping down. And I'm pretty sure martinis were involved in the decision making process because I don't remember saying yes, but I remember getting congratulations notes. And also I have Deborah Stevenson, who is my vice president, is basically Hermione Granger on steroids. She is the most efficient, visionary and wonderful vice president a person can have. And if anything goes right with the media tie in writers, she's more to blame than I am. So now I have to come back and ask you about that Wizard of Oz story. Okay, so um, John Joseph Adams, one of, the, one of the top anthologists around, had reached out to me about doing a story for an Oz anthology called Oz Reimagined. My first inclination before I really gave it thought was to write a story where the Tin Man gets the heart of a serial killer and goes on a murderous rampage, because I thought that would be fun to write. And my fans would dig it. But as I thought about it, I realized that that's really not the audience for Oz, and that would be too self-indulgent. And in media tie-in, you're not writing for your audience, you're writing for the audience of the license. So I, I reread the Oz books and, and realized that there were gentle little kids reading those books. So I, instead, I wrote a story about a little winged monkey girl whose wings were too small for her to fly. So she went looking for magic traveling shoes to take her all the places that the wings couldn't take her. And it was a charming, wonderful little story. And even as I'm writing, I'm like, who is this person sitting in my chair typing on my laptop because it's not me? Who is this guy? You know, the story got a lot of uh, a lot of attention when the anthology came out, and then I got a letter from the estate of L. Frank Baum. And at first, I was a little nervous opening that letter. What it boiled down to is they felt that that story was um, truly in the spirit of Oz, and it has since been added to the official chronology of Oz as a prequel. For wow. Everyone. And I ugly cried, you know, I, I lost, I lost it, you know. Um, I never foresaw something like that. And uh, so, so stuff, stuff like that, you know, is, is, is weird things you never think about when you're going into writing, but they are massive mile markers along the way. And every writer has, has their own moments like this, but that one, I don't think there's any single accolade in my career that has hit me as, as powerfully as that. Um, and it also reinforced, for any writers listening to it, um, it, I did that by going outside of my comfort zone, way outside of my comfort zone. And as a result, I wound up writing something that has profoundly impacted my career and my own view of my skill set. So I'm not saying I'm the greatest writer of all time or any of that nonsense. What I'm saying is that 
that I, I was able to do that and get that accolade because I stretched. And I think that's that's a lesson for all of us writers that sometimes the unexpected, just like Rotten Ruin being, you know, sometimes the unexpected is the doorway that's most solidly open. Yeah, that's a terrific story. And you've also done some TV with Netflix and Wars. So how does, how do you straddle that line with TV and uh, novels? Well, the TV thing, I mean, I, I was not involved in the actual adaptation of V-Wars. Um, that was a, a, another, I had a team of writers for that. Um, I became executive producer toward the end of that run and had it not died because in the COVID era, they didn't want another show about a plague on TV. So thank, thank you for, for the, the plague. Um, if that had continued, I would probably have uh, been involved with Ian Summerholder, our star, plotting and even writing a bit of the second season. Um, nowadays, I'm a little more familiar with, with how Hollywood works. I've got a movie in development. I've got a couple of TV series in development. Uh, and I'm, act I'm an executive producer in all of them. So I'm actually actively involved in the process of, of cultivating these things. And um, it, it's interesting. One of the first things to learn is take your ego out of gear because you're not the only expert on that material. You may be the expert on the original source material, but you have the screenwriter, the director, the actors, the cinematographer. You have to, not, it's not a matter of yielding control, but willingly accepting the shared responsibility for doing this because it is about us, our project. My individual project still exists. The book will always be there. This is a new version of it that a team is doing. And by working enthusiastically with, with the team and really celebrating how creative and visionary so many people are in the different aspects of it, gives you a really wonderful insight into how TV works. And also when you're not a jackass about this stuff, we're not precious about your stuff, more people in the business wanna work with you. People don't like well, to work too hard with somebody who's too hooked on their own stuff. It almost sounds like taking what was a solo project and for the purposes of the TV show, it becomes more of a shared universe. Yes, with a couple hundred people having input in different levels. So yeah, and I mean, like working with Ian, our, our star, he's become a very good friend of mine and he had a lot of thoughts about what, you know, the character, the, the dialogue changes. Um, sometimes he would go and, and, and change a line that's in a script back to a line from the book because he had read the books. Uh, and sometimes he would have something completely new. And you got to you got to respect that he's doing his best job for what he is the expert in, which is being a TV star. Um, and by allowing it, it also allows you as the as the as the creator of the source material to then see a version of it that you can enjoy as a fan as well, because it's not entirely from your head. So there are surprises and new aspects, new interpretations that keep give it a new um, and and multifaceted kind of life that I find extremely fascinating. Well, you're really hearing in that case from the person who inhabits the character, which is about as yeah. close to having the voices in your head be real as you're going to get. Yeah. And sometimes they inhabit the character in a way that's totally different than you intended. A good example of that is in the, uh, the books and the comics, there's a character FBI agent named Jimmy Saint, who is actually in the books, the, his description is modeled after an actor buddy of mine, uh, Keith Strunk. But the guy who was cast to play that character in the, in the movie is full-blood Native American. Um, so he, and he looks Native American. His name is Michael Gray Eyes. They, when they knew they were casting him, they changed the nature of the character a bit. And then, of course, the actor brings his own special magic to it. And it became a completely different character with the same name. Um, and I'm okay with that because that version of it expands not only the diversity of, of the, the cast, but also the insight into those character motivations. A Native American becoming an FBI agent, uh, considering all the politics and, and, and stuff that goes on with, with a Native American dealing with a Fed, becoming a Fed, that added a little bit of nuance, even though a lot of it was just underplayed with his, his natural subtlety of acting. So it was, it was, it was fascinating. I, I, I loved being on a set, I loved being at the table reads, uh, and I loved watching the final product. Well, believe it or not, we have blown through our time today, and I wow. want to leave. I want to leave time for you to talk about anything that you've got coming up, recently released, <laughs> um, just yeah. out. Uh, anything you can say about that, as well as telling people where they can find you online. 
Okay, well, I hope you have a comfortable seat because I'll do the short version of that because it's been a, a busy couple of years. I mean, I, I just finished my 41st novel in, in, in uh, 14 years. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. It was, it, this one is a epic fantasy, Kagan the Damned. It'll be out in, in uh, late spring, first of a new series. Just got a stunning cover quote by uh, author James Rollins, um, which really pleased me all to hell. Uh, because he really he really loved the book, you know, and um, it, so that's coming out. I've got three short story collections coming out and a novel coming out this year. So I've got uh, Joe Ledger, Relentless, the the twelfth book in the Joe Ledger series, comes out July thirteenth. Um, I've got um, Empty Graves, a short story collection of zombie stories, coming out uh, from Wordfire Press on uh, September first. Later in the year, I've got two volumes of a um, short story collection called Joe Ledger. Secret Missions, they'll be coming out from Journal Stone. Uh, we don't have the date or the cover yet, but they'll be coming out soon. And I've got an anthology I co-edited called Aliens versus Predator, based on those two licenses. I, I co-edited with uh, Brian Thomas Schmidt, they'll be out in November. And um, two more issues of Weird Tales coming out this year. So there's a lot of stuff. Easiest way to find what I'm doing and you know, if they want to follow this weird, crazy journey, jonathanmayberry.com and it's m-a-b not m-a-y it's m-a-b-e-r-r-y.com if you're a writer there's a page of free stuff for writers on that website um, but we also announced the different things that are going on there's a newsletter people can sign up for plus i'm on twitter instagram facebook um snapchat linkedin i'm all over the darn place you can't get rid of me awesome well thank you so much for being with us tonight I'm your host, Gail Z. Martin and Morgan Bryce. I'm pretty easy to find under both those names, just about everywhere. But of course, most of the time, you can find me here on Continual. So thank you, Jonathan, for being with us and sharing all the wonderful stories. And thank all of you for watching and listening. There'll be more author interviews coming up here on Continual. So we'll see you online. <laughs>